Hello everyone and welcome to the channel where today we are going to take a look at inverse reinforcement learning or IRL for short. We're going to be taking a look at what it is, why it's useful, and what are some of the general types of methods that you can use to perform IRL. Now, if you have no clue what reinforcement learning is in the first place, I do recommend checking out the RL theory series on my channel. It will get you all caught up. And last thing before we get started, if you do like this video and if you like the content on my channel, I do lots of stuff like this. So smashing the like button, subscribing to the channel really helps out a lot and I really appreciate it. But that is it. Let's get into the video. And I want to start with normal reinforcement learning problems. So for that, oh my gosh, uh, I'll say RL, or oftentimes when we're talking about inverse reinforcement learning, normal RL is just called forward RL. And in forward RL, well, what do we get? We get a reward function, right? Um, so in chess, this could be a plus one for winning, minus one for losing, zero for a draw. And from that, we want to learn, want to learn a policy, right? So this is the typical re uh, reinforcement learning paradigm where we're trying to learn a policy from a reward. So what about inverse reinforcement learning or IRL? Well, the name might, might be a little bit of a giveaway, but we get a policy and then we want to learn a reward function. And I say reward, but really this is a reward function in both of these. Now, when I say this, I do say we get a policy with, this is an asterisk right here. And the reason for that is because there's lots of different types of inverse reinforcement learning. Now, in some cases we do get a policy, but what we see a lot more typically and what most research papers work on solving is the case where instead of a policy, we get expert trajectories. So let me write that out, expert trajectories. So what I mean by expert trajectories is we get data, data of an agent performing some task that we want to learn the reward for. And when I say expert, that generally means it is very good at what it's doing, if not perfect, though sometimes the, this word is a little bit misused within the research. So it, it's kind of okay to use a little bit lightly because even in the research, it's used a little bit lightly. Um, but let me give you an example. So right now I'll put up on screen something from the Berkeley Research Lab where they have essentially a robot that is learning to place books in open spots on a shelf. Now, this could be an example of several things, but what I'm gonna tell you is that a human is actually controlling this robot, which means that this is an expert trajectory. A human is controlling this, and it's showing us how it wants the task to be done. So for us, this would be an expert trajectory. Now, we would actually get this data in the form of like a state and action sequence, right? We might not get the exact video of it. It kind of depends on what your state space looks like and what your actions look like, uh, but that's generally how we receive that input data. So the idea essentially of inverse reinforcement learning though is that by watching these videos, a bunch of these demonstrations, that our model could essentially learn the reward function that this agent or this human is trying to maximize. And the more intuitive meaning of that is that it's trying to learn the goal of the expert, what the expert is attempting to achieve. Then once we do that, if we do actually learn that reward function or goal, well, we you can think, right, then we can go back to normal forward reinforcement learning back up here, and we can use this reward function to learn a policy. So you can think of it as a way of learning how to do something from examples. So one immediate question is probably going to be, well, why would you ever use inverse reinforcement learning? This seems like a bit of a complicated way to go about doing things, um, and it is, but there's some reasons for that. So some reasons as to why you might use inverse reinforcement learning is maybe it's very hard to specify a reward function. So let's take the example of driving a car, right? So I'm not sure if I can draw a car here. I will try my best, you know, <laughs> those are not very safe, but you know, we got our little car here. Um, I, I think that's pretty good. I <laughs> like the video for this car, if, if not anything else. Um, so we got this little car here and we want to drive and, you know, this is autonomous driving. So there's no human here. It's just a robot. And we want to avoid humans. This, this is bad. You know, this is, we don't want to run into humans. What we do want to do is we want to maybe like park or, or get to our goal or it's just getting worse. Um, maybe we have like this parking lot here, right? With all these parking slots and we want to drive into the parking slot. So for this, we would get a negative reward. Maybe uh, for this, we would get a positive reward. Um, 
But the question is, is this is kind of hard to craft, right? Like if you're trying to learn how to drive, it might be like easy to specify like a, a reward based on how close you are to the goal, but you also have to take into account, you know, safe driving. What if there's ice on the ground? How do you balance, you know, how fast you want to get to your destination versus safety? All these things you have to balance out and that's very hard to, to code. So in the case of inverse reinforcement learning, what we can instead do is give our autonomous car right here a bunch of examples of someone doing good driving. And we can just collect that by, you know, putting cameras on cars or like measure this steering wheel and all these inputs and give it to it. And it can learn from that as opposed to having to specify this hard coded reward, which might not be very robust. So that's one reason. A second reason you might want to use inverse reinforcement learning is that maybe all you have are trajectories and you don't have a reward function. Now, I, I didn't prepare an example for this one specifically, but this is definitely something that pops up sometime. And it's fairly similar to this, right? Maybe we can't make a new reward function because uh, it, it's hard to craft, but we already have the trajectory. So we might as well go with an inverse reinforcement learning approach. If you've been thinking about this, one thing you might've noticed is that inverse reinforcement learning is actually very similar to imitation learning. So the question is why not then just use supervised imitation learning? It's essentially the same thing, right? Or at least you get the same outcome. For these tasks, we learn a state to action mapping. The only thing really now, I guess there's some other differences, but the main difference is that the loss function is just kind of different it's usually much simpler to just minimize the difference between our state and our action mappings, right? So we're learning a state to action mapping um, where the state would be like the, uh, the, a picture of the road maybe, of the road. And then our action would be like uh, steer right or, or, or left or stop or all these sorts of things, right? So let me go ahead and erase this actually so we have a clean slate. Um, so the question is why not use supervised imitation learning? And there are a few reasons why we wouldn't use it, even though it can be a lot simpler. There are two primary cases that I, I can think of at least off the top of my head as to why you might prefer inverse reinforcement learning over supervised learning. One of those is that we have a, and I guess I should write a one, is that we have small amount of data so we don't have much data to work with. Maybe we can't collect more, uh, but either way we're limited in this, right? And the second case here is that, or sorry, not the second case, but the other part to this is that you have to learn complex patterns of actions. So if you are in an environment where the actions you're taking are very complex and you have to learn these very difficult things, well, maybe it's just easier to learn a reward function in this case. Right? Instead of learning how to do this, 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 and then this in this certain or order and all this, these specific patterns, maybe we can just learn a very simple reward state and give a reward for that state or, or something of that sort. Right. So once we've learned a reward function in that case, we can actually go back to forward RL and then learn a policy from the reward. And that might be a lot more data efficient. So in the case we have a small amount of data in complex action patterns, inverse reinforcement learning could potentially be a very good solution. So item number two is that inverse reinforcement learning goes beyond imitation. And this is actually really cool um, because imitation, although before I said, well, essentially they're the same thing, right? Supervised learning, imitation, uh, sorry, imitation learning and or supervised imitation learning and inverse reinforcement learning, they actually are a little bit different. And the difference there is that if we have, this is the case here, if we have an imperfect agent Im, or an imperfect expert, I could say, this is where the terminology gets a little bit jumbled in the literature because often we take expert to mean they're, they're perfect at this, but really that's not what lots of the literature means. There's a difference between a demo agent and an expert agent, but oftentimes expert is used for both of those cases. But what if our expert agent isn't really an expert and they're just a demo agent? So if they're really a demo agent, well, that means that there could be room for improvement, right? So while supervised learning would try to completely follow this demo agent over here and do exactly what it's doing, well, if, if we can learn what this demo agent is trying to do and not just what it's exactly doing, 
when we go back to learn a policy with forward reinforcement learning, we might actually be able to do better than imitation learning would do or this demo agent would do. And that's another reason why inverse reinforcement learning is really cool in another case where you can get some great use out of it. So those are the cases where you might want to use inverse reinforcement learning as opposed to something else. So let me go ahead and erase this. And to wrap this up, I want to talk about some of the methods and algorithms that are currently out there for inverse reinforcement learning. Now, what I'll do is I will start with a really early paper from around 2000, one of the earlier papers in the literature for this. And because what you'll see is lots of the research I find is very similar to this or stems off from this paper. So this is a 2000 paper by Ann, oh, Andrew, I think Andrew's his name. I don't know how to pronounce the last name, but this is a 2000 paper. And it proposes three different methods to perform inverse reinforcement learning. Only one of those we're going to be interested in, though, because only one of them uses or learns from expert trajectories. So essentially, this is, I'm just going to give you the algorithm and kind of explain it. It's an iterative algorithm, so we loop um, until, for, well, we'll just say forever for now. Um, but, and we want to be, or maybe at first I should say, given expert trajectories, I'll just say traj for short, but that's trajectories and an environment. We want to loop, or no, sorry, even before the loop, I keep forgetting this. Uh, before we loop, we want to first initiate or init a reward function. And I'll call this phi or phi or whatever you want to call it, phi of i, um, because we'll have a different one for each loop. And then we want to init a policy. So this we will do pi of i, because again, we'll have a different policy for every iteration. And then we want to start a loop. So we want to start our loop. And within our loop, what we want to do is train our policy. Oop. Or I should say train pi, or I should say loop uh, for i in n, where n is just some arbitrary number of loops we want to do. So train. Uh, policy i uh, on our reward function phi of i. Cool. So we have a new policy trained to maximize this reward, whatever this reward is. Now it starts off random. So initially, this will just be a random policy, right? Um, the next step, though, is to calculate values for optimal pol for the optimal policy and our policy using our reward function. So this is using standard uh, a standard value function. So this would essentially be, um, so calculate values. And by the way, I said expert trajectory up here. I will say, let's say expert trajectories, these are generated by pi of star. This is, so this is our optimal policy. So calculate values for our optimal policy and our current iteration policy using our current iteration uh, reward function. So we're essentially calculating the values. And this is, again, if you don't know how we calculate values, that's something you can find out in my reinforcement learning theory series. So do check that out. Um, and then after that, we want to maximize our objective. And what our objective is, is this right here. And I'm going to simplify this a little bit. You, you won't actually be able to use this as is, but I just want to give you the intuitive idea here. But it's essentially the sum of i equals 1 to, I guess this would be k, um, or I should actually do this backwards. It will be maybe k equals 1 to i. Um, and we will say the probability of v uh ran this out Oop. so this value we calculated before of state zero minus the estimated value from our current policy i guess this would be k of state zero by maximizing this we maximize over the parameters theta and this i should say is pi of theta yeah and sorry i should have been a little bit clear here uh, when i say we maximize this we maximize this over the parameters of the reward function phi so what we're actually doing here is we're essentially saying and this is the intuitive definition or the intuitive reasoning behind this is that we have some policy we want to get it as good as we can with this reward function 
once we do that, we essentially say, okay, how good is this new policy and how good is the optimal policy under this current reward function? And because the optimal policy should essentially be the best one, right? We're trying to essentially mimic that. Well, the reward function should always be the, like, the, sorry, the optimal policy should always be or have the highest value under this reward function because, again, right, this reward function, that, that's kind of the definition of what the reward function is for this optimal policy. It's what it's trying to maximize. So that's what we're trying to maximize here. We're trying to maximize the difference between the value for our optimal policy and the value for our policy this iteration or over all the previous iterations. So we're essentially making all these policies. We're making one, we're making two, we're making three, trying to optimize on the reward function. And then we're moving that reward function so that reward function better fits the optimal policy every single iteration. And we essentially keep iterating over this until we end up with a reward function that the optimal policy matches very, very well. Now, I'm not sure if I did a great job explain, explaining that or not. So if that was a little confusing, sorry, but that's the general idea behind it. And that's sort of the algorithm here. There are two last things I want to go over very quickly. I know there's a long video, but this last part will be very short. And that is where the research has been going in inverse reinforcement learning since this paper, since, or I guess not since, well, since this paper, but from a long time after that. So I have two more papers, one from 2008 and one from 2018. Yeah, 2018. The first one is max ent, or that stands for max entropy IRL. And this is a paper that came out in 2008. And it's essentially a way to, that, that helps resolve one of the issues with reinforcement learning. One issue is that given a bunch of expert trajectories, we could generate several potential policies that all maximize the expert trajectory. So if we have our trajectories, there could be policy, or I should not do P, I should do policy one, policy two, policy three. And any of these policies could have generated these trajectories, right? We don't know which one it is, but the way the original IRL problem is framed, we're trying to find one specific one. So what maximum entropy IRL does is it defines a distribution. It takes a distributional approach over these. And that's a better, generally a better way of framing this problem that can end up with some better results. So that is what this paper tries to solve. Another recent, um, this is a more recent paper now, is adversari adversarial IRL. And this tries to solve another problem, a similar one, but a different one. And that is that for a bunch of expert trajectories, not only could many policies explain this, but there could be a number of different reward functions. So reward function one, two, three, the same thing, any of these reward functions or these trajectories could be trying to maximize any of these reward functions. And we don't really know which one it is. So this does not do the same thing. It does not do a distributional approach, but instead it uses an adversarial approach as hinted in the name, where essentially it tries to strip away some of the environments and some of the dynamics around the environment that are usually baked into the reward from previous IRL methods. What that essentially does is previously, well, essentially say you have a car and you're trying to navigate down a specific street or park in a specific slot or spot, generally, if you're trying to use inverse reinforcement learning, the reward function would heavily depend on being in this specific environment and it would break down when you essentially move to any unseen environment, which isn't very good, right? You don't want to, as soon as you see an unknown street crash, that's, that's not ideal. So what this does is it essentially uses a bunch of adversarial examples to strip away those environment dynamics and make a essentially IRL formulation that works a lot better in sort of this transfer where you're seeing a new environment for the first time and you essentially get much more robust re, uh, reward functions that you're learning. So those are just two of the examples of what has been going on recently. I guess 2008 isn't too recently, but 2018 is. So that's the, of essentially what's been going on recently in the field of inverse reinforcement learning. There is still a ton of work to be done in this field. It is very interesting. And I'll make sure to link these papers in the description if you wanna check them out for yourself, if you're interested in this kind of thing. I definitely do recommend it. But anyway, there's some neat ideas. That's all I wanted to share with you for this video. I really appreciate 
you watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do like this type of content, I do a lot of it. So subscribing to the channel is a great way to catch all of it. Anyway, that is it. Thank you so much for watching the video and I hope to catch you next time.